Welcome everybody and welcome to today's seminar. And uh, today we're gonna be doing the F4 fault troubleshooting on the 100 KA and HA boiler. Uh, so if you haven't um, seen any of my troubleshooting, uh, this was my last and final one on uh, the 100. And uh, now um, we're, we have started on the 200s as well. Uh, so if you haven't seen any of the other ones I've done, uh, then you can go there and uh, on that website Miranda was just talking about and uh, we can uh, you can watch all the other ones I did. Uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, and uh, uh, I always leave that top one on there because uh, we, we get the phone call, we get this uh, no heat call, and then we start thinking about it on the drive there. What can it be? What can it be? And sometimes we uh, tend to forget about the basics. So uh, we're going to talk about the combustion triangle just really quick because uh, uh, to me, I just crack up because sometimes it is just basic uh, no gas, no air, or no spark, right? So uh, we tend to, uh, with these new boilers, uh, we tend to think out of the box and then we drive ourselves crazy. And then when we get there, it's something totally different. So out of the 40 years or plus I've been doing this, I learned over the years to put my music on and then just head on to the call and worry about it when you get there. So we're gonna talk about all the different causes of an F4 fault. And a lot of times you're gonna find uh, uh, when you go to the fault code check, it's gonna kind of point you out to the right direction of what to look for. And what I seen on F4, there's a couple of uh, causes and I'm gonna cover all of them. And there's more so that cause it more than others though. And then at the end, we'll talk about clearing the fault history uh, as well on the boiler itself. So we'll get started here. And uh, before we get going, like Miranda said, I did work in tech support. Uh, this was all new after I left uh, tech support. So uh, what we're looking at here is when you do app, if you have to call tech support, uh, there's the number up on the uh, right hand side, or you can text them now, which is pretty cool as well. Uh, but they're going to need the boiler serial number. And on the 100, as soon as you take that cover off, it's on the left hand side inside the boiler where that arrow is pointing to here. They're also going to need uh, which model you're working on. Uh, I uh, used to get that you're working on a Beesman, but on the 100, this is our third or fourth generation on this uh, 100 now. And now we're talking about the B1HE, which is coming out in the near future. So the, the, they do change, so they need to know which boiler you're working on. But the neat thing with that is if you do call tech support and you have any type of issue, they're gonna give you a case number for that boiler. I always told people, write it on the inside of the jacket that you take off because that case number stays with the boiler for the life of the boiler. So anytime you go there, you can look at that case number and they will order, you give it to tech support. They'll all know all about your history because it's all saved in a file. Uh, if you send pictures or if you take over another person's job, say something happens and you got to go there and we told them what to do and you don't know, uh, you can call tech support and they actually will uh, tell you exactly what they told uh, the last guy to do and uh, to cover. And that sometimes can be common as well. Uh, so guys retire and things to that nature. What I always like to talk about is if you don't know about our pro resources uh, on that uh, website where you go to the, uh, for our academy, it's on the same uh, us.com, uh, beesmanus.com. And then you can find all your current manuals, your historic manuals. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And on there, they also have what they call a fault code checker. If you wanna add the fault code checker, you can go to that other screen that you're seeing on the right hand side here and that will show you how to just load the fault code checker. I like to hold, uh, save as a favorite to my phone, just like you would with the fault code checker, but I save all the pro resources. And then that way I have all of this stuff here because it's historical manual. So I put a lot of the older uh, Beesmans in, uh, even when they went, came into the country, I was uh, started putting in their boilers. So there's a lot I have out there that are over 25 years old. And uh, so if you need any of those manuals, they're here. So I tend to, you know, be able to go and look for the manuals that are there. Uh, product warranties. The other thing is when you call tech support, it automatically uh, puts you in the system. So they now know where that boiler is. So if there is ever a problem, they know where that boiler is and who to notify. Technical bulletins, any parts uh, catalogs in there. Takes a little while to load that on, but it's uh, fragmented for all the different boilers. So if you need to look up any of that as well. 
Uh, Veto Spec's pretty cool. If you haven't looked at that, it's uh, kind of a guide of an installation guide of what you might need for residential as well as commercial. And then we have the commercial application guide. So if you do commercial as well, there it is. So this is just gonna show you how to add, excuse me, the fault code checker to your phone. But like I said, I normally add the whole pro resources just like this. And this would be the page I would say as a favorite. It does look like an app on your phone. Uh, it's not It's not really an app though, but it does look like an app. And I, I got a Droid and an iPhone, uh, uh, one for work and one my personal, uh, and it works on either one. So uh, it's a nice little tool to have if you do a lot of our boilers or even if you haven't done any of our boilers. And uh, uh, helpful tools as well as videos online if you haven't done any of these service uh, type uh, relations uh, or even service the boiler. Uh, there's a how to on the, the web as well. So these might be some of the tools for this uh, fault that you might need. So you're going to see that we have a, a, a multimeter a toolkit. Uh, it's not really necessary to have our toolkit, but we do sell it. Uh, the neatest thing in the toolkit is that screwdriver, which is extendable. But as long as you have torque uh, heads and torque screwdrivers, uh, uh, pretty much cover the, the boiler itself, a small screwdriver. And then uh, that's just a pen with a stylus because I have a crooked finger. So if you want to touch the touch screen, uh, it's easier with the pen. The other thing you're definitely going to need for this uh, one here is the uh, um, a manometer. And this is all the tools that we should be carrying nowadays for these uh, boilers anyway. So if you don't have these tools and you're new in the business, these are the tools I recommend highly of getting to give you a step above your competition because there are people that still don't use these things and uh, why should we uh, adjust gas pressures and things to that nature? Well, you're gonna have issues if you don't. So these tools, uh, the uh, metric adjustable, right-handed uh, adjustable today, uh, we well, can use it uh, for a left-handed uh, if you flip it over right. So here we go, here's your uh, combustion triangle and that's why I just leave this up. Just remember that this is basics, right? If we don't have air, spark, or fuel, that boiler is not gonna light. This goes from your atmospheric right up to our uh, power burners on these, uh, these boilers that we're talking about today. Uh, so this here is for the contractors. And if I do have any engineers, uh, I put it this way, oxygen, ignition, and fuel. All right. So here's our sequence of operations for bo uh, both boilers. <clears throat> for a heat demand, <clears throat> and it works the same for the KA as well as the HA. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, once we get a call for heat uh, through an end switch or uh, external uh, demand or uh, a T, uh, T stat, <clears throat> the internal pump will start. The three way mixing valve will switch over to heating. The burner will uh, uh, fire and then uh, go to its set point or modulate to the outdoor temperature heating curve that we have on, on this boiler. You can do it either way. And then uh, once that heat uh, demand disappears, the boiler will stop. You have a little uh, post purge there, as you can see, about four minutes after delay. And then uh, it uh, diverts back. So it sleeps in the domestic mode. So it, when it's not doing anything, it's sleeping in the domestic mode. <clears throat> And if you didn't read that uh, uh, at the very bottom on this boiler here, you can do our number five domestic sensor 
or you can do a um, Aquastat. If you're not using our, uh, our uh, DHW sensor, uh, it's not gonna default. So it, it probably might just stay in the heating uh, thing, but I have always seen it in both circumstances sleep in the uh, domestic. So I'm not sure why that was added. <clears throat> So uh, uh, operations of domestic, uh, so on the uh, left-hand side, we're talking about the HA, which is the, we got now an indirect tied to this boiler here. Uh, so we get a call from the thermistor or the uh, aquastat, the internal pump starts, burner starts. Once it hits its set point, burner stops, and then uh, pump will stop after 30 seconds. On the KA model, there's a flow uh, sensor in your domestic side and soon as it hits that 0 0.4 GPMs, uh, the pump now starts and then the burner starts. And then when you shut your faucet off, uh, we go uh, drop below that 0 0.4. And then that pump, same thing, runs for about a 30 second delay. Talk about different faults. Uh, we got hard faults, soft faults, uh, and uh, some of them are going to be operational with, uh, with the uh, domestic and not for heating or uh, vice versa. Let's talk about those really quick. Uh, the difference between a hard and soft lockout. And this here we actually made up. Uh, there's actually a ladder diagram, but uh, we uh, took it a little step further and made our own here. Uh, just to help you make it easier uh, uh, troubleshooting. Uh, you're all gonna get sent this out in a PDF form. You can always print this out or take a snapshot of it so you can have it on your phone uh, in case you don't have Wi-Fi or something like that. But uh, it's a nice little uh, ladder diagram for uh, this F4 fault. I leave this up here for, uh, I've done all these different faults now uh, on the, uh, the Academy uh, website. Uh, so uh, what you can see what happens when you get the different faults that I have gone over. And today with the, the F4, you would add up all these uh, seconds down here. And then that's about when the F4 fault would happen. Yeah, I'm not gonna find this in the manual. These are some uh, things that uh, we tested in the lab and try to test it uh, basically. So a uh, difference between a hard and a loss, uh, uh, hard and a uh, soft lockout is the difference between them is uh, if you lose your outdoor sensor, you're not going to lose your boiler. You're not going to have to go down there and hit the reset button. Uh, it will still run and maintain temperature. A hard lockout is you're going to have to go down there and uh, hit the R a reset on the boiler. Uh, once you fix a soft lockout, it automatically clears itself. After you fix a hard lockout, you still have to hit that R button to clear the fault. Just showing you some different faults that come in hard and uh, soft. This is the only boiler, if you didn't know that we do not need our outdoor sensor uh, connected to the boiler, you can, but you can also shut it off. I do teach uh, a lot of uh, the training for the people for the uh, that give out the rebates and they're talking about they're going to start going out looking at these boilers to make sure people are using outdoor reset because that's one of the reasons why you're getting that pretty substantial uh, re uh, the customers anyways the, the rebate. So this is what it says uh, when you get an F4 fault no flame uh, signal present and uh, here are the main causes of an F4 fault. And we're gonna cover them all. Uh, just pay attention up here. Uh, we see that flame sensor uh, boot. And up here, it gives you the uh, ohms resistance here, but we're gonna cover that as well. Other things it can be is uh, no gas, bad electrodes, bad gas valve, or believe it or not, a condensate buildup. And when I was in tech support, to me, that was one of the number one calls I did see for this fault was condensate buildup. And we'll cover all of that. Normally when you're in our class, we go through all of this and then we say it's a bad gas valve just to give you the opportunity to change the gas valve if you've never done it. So you get to change the gas valve and see how quick and easy it is to do. 
First thing we'll cover is, uh, do we got gas coming to the boiler? Do I have enough gas coming to the boiler? Uh, normally, uh, after we installed it, there could be things that happen to us uh, that uh, causes this problem. So what is my gas pressure? Here I, I'm looking at my standing gas pressure. I can see that I do have gas to the, uh, to the boiler. I'm about 8.4 uh, inches of water column here. And remember our uh, boiler can operate anywhere on natural gas from four to 14, propane 10 to 14. So if we got there and then we hooked up our manometer, we turned it on and then this came up, uh, well, we would start looking for issues, correct? Because we're uh, way below that uh, uh, four inches of water column. So how are we gonna check that to make sure that we are getting gas? As you can see, my hose is now hooked up to the gas valve where that uh, slides onto. Uh, there's a, a flat tip screwdriver, small. You're gonna just crack that open and leave that open. So when you wanna do your high and low fire test to do your combustion test when you first install it, there's no need to take that off. Just once you put it on, you're gonna be fine. And then you're gonna go through the controls and we're gonna go over all of that as well. So this is how we're gonna test our gas pressures. So uh, if we're not getting a call for uh, heat or anything like that to get the boiler to run, this is a much easier way of doing it. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna hit that mode button. Then we're gonna hit the arrow until serve is flashing. Once serve is flashing, that stands for service. This is gonna come up and uh, we're gonna hit okay when it's flashing. So as you can see, it, it starts with uh, off. And then when we hit okay, it's gonna allow us to hit the up arrow. And now we can put it at 20%. So now we can test it at low fire and see what we're getting for a reading there. And then what we wanna do is to make sure that our, our uh, gas valve isn't clogged or we don't have cloggage, we wanna ramp up the high fire to make sure that it doesn't get starved out, right? So I've seen uh, dirt packed pipes, uh, plastic uh, end caps from the pipe get uh, forced into the uh, pipe itself and create issues uh, down the road, not right away, but then they turn and uh, completely block the hole with uh, sediment as well. Uh, so we want to make sure it's not getting snuffed out when we're going to high fire. So what we would do is once we test it in low fire, we would now ramp up and hit the uh, hit OK. And then we would ramp up and go all, all the way up to 100%. And that would be uh, putting us into high fire. So the next thing we want to do is check in power to our gas valve, making sure we're getting power to our gas valve itself um, and to make sure that we're getting the proper voltage for that gas valve to open when it should. As you can see, I turned the power off. Uh, just make sure you're not touching your, your little metal probes while you're doing this or you'll get a pretty good jolt because uh, we are testing in DC current. And as you can see, I have my two uh, leads on the two outer prongs of that uh, test port. In the manual, it says that you should be getting about 120 VDC. I've tested all these boilers. Uh, we've tested it in tech support. Uh, you'll get a higher resistance when you have it on the gas valve. So I normally take it off. And the most readings you're always going to get is about a 107, 108 VDC, and that's DC current. From what I uh, learned over playing with these things, if you want to check it in AC current, like it says, uh, what you have to do is take one lead and put it into the center, which is your ground, which is that green and yellow wire in the center. And then your other to one side and you put your meter to AC, it's gonna read 60 volts. Then you're gonna take your black lead and go to the other side of the black lead and still keeping your wire uh, test lead on the green and yellow and you're gonna get another 60 volts. So I guess that's the way they do it in Europe. I don't know, it's not the way we do it here in the US, but that will give you 120 volts. Best way, put it in DC current and then put your meters on the uh, two outer prongs. You're gonna get about 107, 108 VDC. And there you go. So I'm testing it now. The, the power was back on uh, and there's my reading. Uh, so that's telling me that that gas valve is getting the proper voltage to it.
Next, we want to check our flame sensor uh, reading. So what we're going to do is remove that boot from the top uh, onto your uh, flame sensor and your igniter, and then put to your other end of your meter. So you're going to need alligator clips to clip it onto the flame sensor. And then you're going to need uh, alligator clip to clip it onto your uh, egg, uh, transformer down on your control. So you got to pop your cover off the control and get to that. Then you're going to fire the boiler and see what your readings in, uh, are going to be. Um, <clears throat> normally, I, for some reason, uh, during uh, me uh, changing out pitches here, I, I lost the reading. Uh, but I actually had a 3.5 reading on this here which was telling me that I was above the 2.0 that they say in the manual. So uh, my flame sensor was good on this one here so I could continue on with my test. While I have that uh, black leads off inside that cable itself, and that's right out of the manual here. And I took that right on your uh, ladder diagram that's in the manual. Just make sure when you're doing this test, as you can see, it says at the very bottom there, your meter must be fuse protected. So make sure that you're uh, using a, a, a pretty decent meter uh, so you don't uh, mess up your meter. Next, we wanna uh, test the wire itself. As you can see uh, to the far right, I have uh, the, uh, the boot off uh, the flame sensor here. And right on the flame sensor boot, it tells you it's a 5K ohms resistant uh, uh, cable. Inside here, there's actually a resistor in there that can go bad. So to check this, you're just gonna go from one end of your cable to your other end of the cable. And anything uh, below the, uh, 4.5, they say uh, replace the cable. Uh, they've uh, since upgraded these cables to a, 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 a much better cable actually uh, than the ones prior when they first came out. Uh, even uh, back when they were making them in Germany, they had changed them pretty quickly. So to replace the gas valve itself, uh, you're gonna find it's fairly easy. Again, we're gonna turn off the gas to the boiler. And normally we're gonna go out to the lab. So these are little uh, reminders for me to make sure I'm shutting the gas, the power and all that stuff that you guys are gonna work on. Uh, but it is a helpful tool to remind us uh, as busy as we get. And sometimes we're trying to get this one done to get to the next one. So it just, you'll know right off anyways, because we're gonna disconnect the gas. First thing we want to do is unplug that uh, plug going to the gas valve. And as you can see, it's plug number 35. If you don't know, all our plugs are numbered and marked so they can only go into uh, the spots uh, that they're located. There is a little clip uh, that you just push down to unlock it. And then you're just going to pull it straight out towards you. And that's just pointing where it is. Next, we're gonna undo the uh, gas connection, which is that brass nut that you're seeing, the large brass nut on the side here. And that's where you're gonna use that uh, metric uh, right hand adjustable uh, wrench. Making sure uh, if we are, uh, we can, uh, while we have this off, what we might wanna do is uh, if we're uh, having a problem with our volume dropping, Inside here, there is an inlet gas screen. Just make sure that that didn't get clogged if you're having a pressure issue. For this example, we've got a bad gas valve. So it's just showing you how to replace the gas valve. But inside here, uh, normally is this uh, fiber washer. It does come with the new gas valve as well as the two screw, uh, torque screws that you're gonna take off. Uh, because we tend to drop them sometimes, they go into that black hole, never to be found again. Uh, so they give you two new screws uh, and you're gonna find that it has some type of uh, lock paste on them as well. So as you can see, two torque uh, T25s, remove those two. If you're doing propane, make sure you take your propane office and put it to the side because you have to put it back in. Uh, it does not come with a new orifice for propane. So if you're using propane, make sure you take that orifice out 
because you're going to install it in the new uh, gas valve. It does come with a new uh, rubber O-ring. And then we're just going to reinstall in the reverse order. <clears throat> Here's your part number for your gas valve. Excuse me, just to let you know, the gas valve's the same on the HA as the KA, <clears throat> as well as the control itself is the same control for either boiler. So you only need to carry one for each boiler. Uh, if you haven't ever changed out control before in the coding, there's a coding that you have to tell when you change out the control, what boiler you put in that control. And that's why you can put it uh, uh, as a universal. So if it get wet or something like that, then um, you only have to carry one of each. So let's talk about uh, reasons for condensate buildup. As you can see here to the left, this is what we would see once we took the, door, uh, the burner out itself. So we got some buildup on here. Uh, so you can see that the condensate's still running, but you can see that the water uh, marks here are building. So what water is building up to this line here. So if you see water marks on the back target wall or on the front target wall, start looking why your condensate's not draining down. It could be clogged inside here. And by the way, this is a formiculite. So that's that fire retirement material that we've used in chambers forever. Uh, with this uh, boiler here, those are pressed together with like a potato stock. So we don't want them to get wet. So that's why we tell you to remove them when you're washing the boiler down. So if the uh, condensate's building this up, it's gonna stop breaking down because the steam's gonna hit that. Actually the heat's gonna hit that and it's gonna turn to steam and start flaking that stuff off that target wall. So if you see any type of water buildup, you have some type of condensate buildup. Some of the causes can be a, a dirty trap. So this one here, I took right out of our lab here on uh, just so you could see uh, what happens to the stones after service hasn't been performed in years uh, or not even in years. So you can start to see scum starts to build up around the, the pellets itself. And so what starts to happen is that condensate just comes in and gets a free ride over to the top and right out the, uh, the back. So you're not neutralizing anymore. So that should be part of your annual maintenance and it could be part of your cause of your condensate buildup. Biggest cause I saw for condensate buildup was double traps. This, all our boilers have traps in them already. So there's no need to add another trap to the boiler. No need to wrap uh, excess holes inside the boiler or outside the boiler. I have had uh, the two two twos go up and down like this because there was a hose. You can cut the hose shorter is, uh, just because it has that fancy little fitting on the end. You can still cut your hose. Uh, sometimes I'll stick a piece, a little piece of half inch inside there and then put it in an open mouth with like a one inch uh, to a three quarter or whatever. Uh, so we get that air break. The way I've always explained that over the phone was it's like uh, when you, we were kids, we used to be able to suck on a straw. You put your finger on it and you can hold all the fluid inside that straw, right? As soon as you take that finger off, all the fluid goes away. So what's happening here is that water is building up inside the heat exchanger and it's going to go right to your flame sensor and short it out, which is going to cause an F4 fall. So on these here, uh, they should be getting checked on an annual maintenance uh, just for uh, these reasons, as well as uh, we want to uh, provide comfort uh, for the homeowner where they don't have to call us in the middle of the winter at 3 a.m. This is what the inside would look like. Uh, this is with the back target wall removed. They do re recommend removing the, uh, the target wall uh, fire retardant material during the annual maintenance. But this, uh, the, this uh, actually a stainless steel plate that goes over that as well, uh, which these screws here, if you're gonna do that, I would recommend maybe cruel oil on these screws. Uh, or if you get them out, maybe put some heat paste on there for the next guy, uh, something that I recommend. This is what your uh, condensate neutralizer should look like after you clean and change the pellets. Uh, this is our older model here. We have a newer model, which uh, all your pellets come in a mesh bag. <clears throat> so if they get hot as a brick, because a lot of times we're not condensating these boilers because we're running them too hot. 
So uh, not a lot of condensate gets into those uh, neutralizers and then they turn into one solid brick. So in that case there, you're gonna replace all the pellets. Uh, our older model there, uh, you could uh, wash the pellets, replace them and put them back and then just replace what was missing. Our newer ones come in a mesh bag for our residential. You just take the mesh bag, throw it away and put a new mesh bag. Pretty quick, it adds uh, more value to your annual maintenance as well. Uh, and uh, what I always explained to people was when I first started putting these boilers in, when they first come out, nobody was talking about neutralizations. The supply houses didn't know about it. So we were making them out of PVC and we were putting uh, the pellets in there. We weren't sure if they were the right size, but now in the manuals, they all give you how much condensate these uh, boilers produce uh, within an hour. I have two, two, uh, 222s on one condensate pump because uh, as much condensate as I could produce that one pump that I put in with the neutralizer could handle both boilers. So it, once we start reading about it uh, and the importance of uh, what this uh, prevents out down the other way, uh, killing bacteria in your leach fields, uh, uh, burning holes through your trap. I've seen them uh, in slop sinks and basements. They don't wash this use the sink that much and then it starts eating holes in the trap. So I've seen all of this stuff happen. So to me, uh, neutralization as well as what I really started noticing, it was eating the shafts off my pumps, my uh, condensate pumps. Hey, job security if you don't want uh, and you can go replace things if you like. Um, I, I tend to not want to go out in the middle of the night or anymore at all. So uh, be proactive. So about the halfway mark here, uh, we're going to have a video coming up right after this. So it's going to show me, every, show you everything, me doing it for you uh, in a video. So if you have any questions, feel free, make sure you're asking your questions, get your answers. And it doesn't have to be on this fault. Uh, I've done them all now, so. All right, it looks like that we do not have any questions at this time. Um, if you would like to give it a couple seconds, Jay, see if anything comes in. But if not, you can continue on. Okay. Please oh, don't. One did pop up. There okay. we go. <laughs> Wait the extra second, right? <laughs> you wouldn't want me in your class because I that's how I learn. I ask tons of questions. So that's the way I get my answers. So absolutely. All right. So how do you get the screws out out that hold the metal plate behind the refractory? Like I said, I, I, I use what they call it. It's called cruel oil. It's a penetrating oil. And uh before I do uh, any of that stuff, I, I, I spray them down after I take that donut out and then give it a little squirt because uh, even my boiler, the uh, older ones have it as well. Uh, so they um, just give it a little time. And then I have one of those screwdrivers when you push on it, it actually pops it. So it kind of breaks it free. Uh, if not, it, uh, just make sure you're careful um, and twist them off. But uh, I've taken them off uh, even on some of the older stuff and uh, after I spray it with that oil, it's pretty good. But then I put uh, some heat paste on the screws so I don't have to worry about it next time. Or even if you're installing it, wouldn't hurt just to see what's behind there and put your heat paste on there before you even fire it. It takes a matter of five, and I'm uh, exaggerating five minutes to take that burner out and put it back in uh, and take all those screws out. So it, it's really quick. That's what I love about Wiesman's boilers. Uh, the ease of service and the ease of uh, to get to anything. There was one thing I did uh, to take the donut out, the target wall itself, there's just one, uh, I wanna say it's a eight millimeter nut right in the center, I'm almost certain. And then there's a washer behind that. Uh, so if you see uh, my service uh, tra uh, training as well, uh, I show how to do that as well. Great. Um, one comment to go along with the screws. Um, have you ever seen the three screws breaking off or what would cause that? I have seen the screws break. Uh, yet, uh, not on this model here, but on the other ones. Uh, on the 200s, they have the same baffle as well. And some of them were that I've worked on were in for you know like four or five years uh, and nobody's it ever took that apart. So I, I did some investigating on one and uh, yeah, one of them did snap. Uh, you are able to get the aluminum rings that they go into. So if you do happen to do that, um, uh, what I did for, uh, for that one screw that broke, I just put some uh, 
red silicone up there behind it to hold it in place until I could get back out there and replace the ring. Uh, the rings are very important. So if you do that, uh, you gotta make sure that they're in the exact place and you have to put that uh, ring back on with, uh, I wanna say it's one Newton meter. So you would have to ask Siri what one Newton meter is on foot pounds. All right. Do you recommend high temp silicone on back plate to help hold the ring in place? It, it, you don't really need to. Uh, they do have some red silicone in the back, but that's for the expander bolt that's on the very top that expands those two aluminum rings to lock it in place. That's why they put that silicone in there so it doesn't move. But you really shouldn't have to. Um, and uh, the newer ones, uh, it's uh, going to be different as well. So. Uh, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, just remember that uh, that gets pretty hot there. Uh, so it's going to be some high temp so, uh, silicone. All right, looks like that is the last one, Jay. You can continue on. Great. Keep the questions coming, guys. I like questions. That's the way everybody learns. And then at the end, uh, uh, I get all these questions uh, to me. I fill them out and then everybody gets them back. So if one person asks a question that somebody else wanted to ask, uh, he's gonna get it anyway. So make sure you ask any questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question because that's the way I learn. And that's the way uh, I would never feel embarrassed to ask questions. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start this now. Jay, can you just make sure your computer sound is on? Yeah, I'm just trying to pause it here. Hi, welcome to Wiesman Manufacturing. We're laughing Today we're at me in our here. training facility. We're going to be doing some troubleshooting on the F4 faults. Next, let's go take a uh, look at our pro resources and see what the F4 fault was caused by and see how we're going to repair the F4 fault on this boiler. It's a really helpful tool. Now that we went and saw the F4 fault on our fault code checker, if you want to see how to get that fault code checker on your phone, check out that video as well. So for this fault on the F4, we'll get started. Things that I would check before I even break out any meters or anything like that. This is my gas turned on. Do I have propane in the tank? These are two quick, easy checks that you can check by looking at your propane tank and making sure that we have propane in the uh, tank. Or we can throw our manometer on there, which I'll be going over later on in this presentation. But let's start off with our uh, checking power to our gas valve. So I'm gonna go over a few of the causes and effects of what could cause and how to fix them all. It could be one thing, but I'm gonna show you how to check all the different things for an F4 fault. So let's power the burner down. First thing I want to check is get my meter. I'm going to put my meter on DC current. And we're going to check what the power is coming through our gas valve. When you take your plug off the gas valve, you're going to get less resistance. So there's two ways you can check this plug. You can put your meter on AC and check from the green wire to the black and get 60 volts. 
or and then from uh, the other black to your ground and get 60 volts. And then you combine those, you get 120 volts. Here on your plug 35, as you can see, as our plugs are all marked for our gas valve as well as all our other plugs on the boiler. We can check it with DC current by going to black to black. So that's what we're gonna do here on this test here. So we're gonna take our meter and put it on the two outside uh, plugs. And we'll check our uh, voltage going to the gas valve. So normally what I see here with no resistance, uh, normally you're gonna get about a 106, 108 VDC. Uh, when it's off the, um, when it's connected to the burner, you're gonna get that 106, 108 because you're gonna have some resistance through the coil as well. So we're just gonna take our prongs, stick them in our two outer test ports, our plugs on our controls. If you have smaller, they work pretty well, but we're gonna now power our burner back on. And you'll check our voltage here. And it should be uh, roughly around 127 VDC when it goes to fire. Just make sure you're not touching any of your wires, connections. We go to serve here, get the boiler to fire. I'll start it with 20%. Hit OK. We'll see the boiler fire. So there you go, there's your 107 VDC, 106, 108. So now you can see that we have the VDC rating on the boiler. Just make sure you're in DC current when you're reading the gas valve. And like I said, you can do it in AC current as well, but where there you are, we've got the 108 there, so. We'll power that on, so now we know that we got the uh, right voltage to our gas valve. Next thing we wanna check is our flame sensor and our flame sensor reading, as well as we can check our ground. The ground is very important on this boiler here when you're doing flame sensor reading with your ground. So we gotta take the cover off the boiler now off the control. There's two ears on the sides here and then two on the bottom. You pop those off and then now you can see where your transformer is and your grounds. Here's your mechanical ground. So to test this ground going up to your control, you're going to test from, uh, your, uh, from here to your ground and make sure that you have a good uh, wire in between as well. Make sure there's no resistance or breaks or anything touching on the metals because uh, any uh, bad flame sensor reading, you're not gonna light. The other thing that I would recommend as well is, is if your gas is not, uh, readings are, is, are, are low, we have an inlet gas screen as well. So I would pull the whole burner right off so we can check our electrode to our flame uh, burner tube itself. Uh, and that way we make sure we have the right distance between our burner tube and our flame sensor and our igniter. Make sure there's no holes in the burner tube or anything like that, because that also can cause an F4 fault. So now that we got our readings on the gas valve and uh, where our meter is uh, reading correctly, next thing we want to check is, like I said, we'll check our ground uh, wire, make sure that's okay, or we can do a flame sensor reading as well. So for this here, I use the clip alligator clips on my meter. Just so I get a good connection, uh, sometimes I find that the boots get in the way, but make sure um, you're not touching these uh, when they're connected because uh, you'll get a good jolt. I do this here first because I'm going to then check the ohms resistance on my cable itself next. Uh, when we do this here, we're going to fire the boiler. We should see the boiler fire, and then we can watch our, uh, our readings here. We'll put it back into the test mode. Each time you have to wait for it to go through its test cycle. And then hit the mode button. All right, so now you can see our reading here at the bottom. So we got it on low fire, the boiler did fire. So we're at 5.6, so we're still pretty good. Anything below three, three and a half is bad. So we're still in the good range here. The boiler is firing. We could go up to high fire and check it as well, but now we see that our flame sensor is reading above uh, 5.7 in that range. So the boiler is running, so we can check that. So we check that off the list. We're getting the proper flame sensor reading off there, and that's in DC microlamps, all right?
As the flame gets hotter, our readings will go up higher. So now you can see that that test there. The next thing while I have my wire off, we'll check the uh, wire itself. And you can see right on here, it has five ohms. So five kilo ohms written right on there. So we'll check this next. As you can see, it doesn't take long to test all these things, as long as you've got the right tools to do these things. Uh, and see what we're getting for Yeah, people reason. helping you learn so how to use these things. Uh, I know I, I learned a lot on my own back and in the day. And now you can see we're about <laughs> 4.7. Anything under 4.5, they recommend you replace the cable itself. So that's how you check the cable on this here. And as you can see, we're in the right ohms, we're above 4.5. Uh, so the cable is fine. So we can plug all this back in. So we've checked our electrodes. We checked our ground. Make sure we had a good ground uh, coming to the boiler as well to make sure that we're not getting any interference to the boiler. Uh, next, I would check my gas pressures to make sure that the gas pressures are correct. Other things you can check is if you're doing propane, you can check for uh, your copper lines, make sure that they're not breaking down from suffocation so that uh, your uh, propane will stop actually breaking down the in, uh, copper tubing if you're running copper tubing for your gas piping over to the boiler. So that's one thing you can check as well. And that will actually uh, start to clog up your, uh, your gas green. So during your annual maintenance, it's good to uh, take a look at that inlet gas green on your boilers, uh, on anybody's boiler really, because it um, the uh, effects of gas is um, getting clogged. So now I'm just gonna grab my manometer here. And uh, all we have to do is I'll shut my gas off for a second. And we just need our small little screwdriver. And we're just gonna crack the inlet of our gas uh, coming in, maybe a half a turn or so. Yeah, you don't want to screw it all the way so it falls out. out. And then just put your manometer on there. Turn the gas back on. So we can see what we're getting for our standing pressure. So now as you can see, we're about 8.47 of our standing pressure. That means we're just standing there and nothing's happening. Leave your manometer hooked on there and let's go back through the test. Turn the boiler back on. Remember it's four to 14 for natural gas and 10 to 14 for propane. Uh, so we're in the right range here. I'm gonna go back into the test. Get the boiler to fire again. So now you can see we had a little drop uh, going into low fire, but it kind of steadies back off. So we can check our low fire. We're still with, well within the range that we, uh, we, we should be. We didn't have a great uh, substantial drop. If you had a big drop in there, that to me is a volume issue, or it could be a clogged gas line or something like that. If you see a big drop when you go to light. Same thing if we go to go into high fire. Remember serve, and then we're gonna go up to 20%. And now we're gonna go all the way up to 100%. All right, you'll see the boiler go my to high fire now. And we can watch our manometer. Still rising, but it's not dropping dramatically. So that means we've got some good volume, meaning that our gas piping is big enough. And that's a big issue that I used to see in tech support was gas piping too small. And the other thing is remember about your elbows. Elbows uh, equivalent to feet. Sometimes we get to measure all those elbows on your gas piping and then we're undersized. So now you can see our pressure still holding steady. We didn't even drop under an inch. Any more than an inch, I recommend to start looking at a volume or uh, a pressure problem with your gas. So that checks out good as well. So we'll shut the boiler back down.
shut our gas back off, and then close our gas. So all the things that we checked for the F4 fault, uh, one last thing you might want to take a look at is your venting. Make sure there's no venting issues where you can push through there. Uh, in this uh, uh, scenario here, if it was a bad gas valve, you would replace the gas valve by pulling this one plug off. Remember, we do have our gas shut off. The one brass nut here, and then these two uh, torque 30 screws. The torque 30 screws will take the gas valve right off. Remember, if you do have a... Um, an orifice in there for propane, and I'll show you that right now. Hold on there. So. so for this fault here, we'll change the gas valve. Here's your gas valve, the part number itself. What your new gas valve uh, looks like, and it comes with uh, the new rubber grommet here, as well as two new screws, in case you drop your screws on the floor and you can't find them again. Remember, on propane, you're going to have an orifice inside here. So make sure you save that orifice uh, when you uh, change the gas valve. So you got two screws, uh, two torque head screws, the two uh, T30s. Uh, and then here's your inlet gas screen is inside here. So you can inspect that too as, uh, if it gets clogged, uh, you can uh, clean it out. Or if it's really bad, you might want to just replace the gas valve itself because uh, when stuff gets inside here, it could damage the gas valve itself. You have your own torque wrench is fine. We also sell a toolkit for our boilers here. Well, that must have been the left-handed adjustable. Just remember there is a pliable washer on here. Get a nice tray inside here you can put your tools in. So you can see how a gas valve is done. So there's your little rubber boot. And then the back here, there's a little nipple that just slides over. Just so make sure when you're putting the new gas valve on, you get that rubber boot over that uh, nipple on the other side. Once you do uh, replace the gas valve, you want to make sure that you and get your analyzer on here as well and make sure that we're running in the proper CO levels. What you'll find with these ones, uh, everything's nice and easy to work on. You can get to everything. If you have to get to back things, this is the combi unit here as well. I find the four bolts that you pull off or uh, the hex head saw for your, uh, your burner, take your, your one nut, this all comes out in one piece. We can inspect your burner tube, we can do all of that, and then it allows you to get to anything else in the back of the boiler here. Uh, that's what I've always liked about uh, these men all the years I've been putting them in, it was the ease of service. Make sure you put that fiber washer back in like I did. You'll know right off if you didn't. Just gonna plug in our wire back in here. Sure, everything's plugged back in. Put our cover back on. <clears throat> Close it up. Turn your gas back on. Right, you can do a quick gas check with some bubbles or a sniffer if you'd like, um, and just make sure you have no leaks when you're done. We'll power the boiler back on as it goes through all its test uh, cycles one more time. Now we're going to go into uh, serve mode just to see the boiler fire before we go to make sure we fix the problem. So hit your mode button and then hit your arrow until serve is flashing. Once serve is flashing, we hit OK. As you see, it comes with uh, off and then we can go up to 20%. Now at 20% or 20% uh, is low fire on this boiler. At 20%, after you change the gas valve, they want you to throw your, mono, uh, your analyzer up into the uh, port, uh, your fluid test port on top of the boiler. Once we do that, we can hit OK. And we want to do a test at the uh, low fire. So you'll see the boiler come on. And with an F4 fault, the boiler's going to try to fire four, uh, three times. 
Uh, it's like three strikes, you're out. On a, and then on the third try, if it doesn't fire, you get the F4 fault. So now you can see the boiler has fired, so we have fixed the problem. This is where you want to check your CO2s and O2s, uh, as we see in the, uh, in the charts in our manuals. Once we do the uh, low fire test, we can now come over and hit the mode button once again until service uh, flashing. Hit OK. Now we're going to go from that 20% and we're going to go all the way to 100%. Once it hits 100%, we now hit OK. Still having your analyzer in the boiler, you'll see now see the boiler modulate up and go up to high fire. We're getting close, people. I don't like watching myself, that's for sure. Once you go up into high fire, then you, for, you have your analyzer in there. Make sure you're uh, within the, the range of our CO2s and our O2s that we have in our uh, manuals. Uh, so you know you're within the scale. Uh, the, the new gas valves adjusted correctly. And uh, if there's any type of issue with the newer gas valve and it needs adjustments, uh, they uh, want you to call tech support uh, to make any type of gas valve adjustments. Just remember with gas valves and propane and different fuels at different times of the year, you're gonna get different readings. So you might put this in in the winter time and get one reading and then go back in the summertime and get a different reading. That's kind of normal because the air quality changes heavier ears, lighter ears. So once we tested that, um, we just make sure that we hit the return arrow and that will take us out of the test mode. So right now we're getting a call for heat. So that's why the boilers continue to stay running. Um, with that being said, uh, this concludes our F4 fault for the day. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here at Beesman uh, Academy and Training. All right. We got one more quick little video here and then we're done. Uh, so if you got more questions, start writing them now. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about that too is uh, once you go through all your tests and you leave it in the test mode there, it will actually time out. I believe it's after 30 minutes, it will time itself out and then go back to normal operation as well. So if you did forget to uh, hit out of the test mode there, it will time out just like in the purge mode. Uh, if you haven't used the purge mode and you went to coding one to purge the boiler, um, that will time out after 20 minutes. So uh, there are some time uh, things in here as well. Lastly, I wanted to say, uh, you know, uh, talking about gas volumes and counting your 90s and things of that nature, sometimes we do our job correctly and then the homeowners hire somebody else to come in and put maybe a, a generator in or a, a gas log or something like that. But uh, I did find with uh, some of our boilers that when they did add the uh, uh, generators and they tend to want to cycle themselves on a Wednesday. So on our boilers, they will give you fault codes uh, on our 200s, they'll give you fault codes with the time and date. So I actually did troubleshooting on some of those where we found out what was happening every Wednesday was the generator that they installed, which they never upgraded the gas piping with it, uh, was sucking all the gas out of the boiler. So before we leave, we want to make sure that uh, we clear all the faults on this boiler. So with this here, boiler, you can go and see your last top 10 faults. So say Mrs. Jones uh, went down there on that F4 fault, hit the reset button, and maybe there was a pocket of air in your propane or something like that, the boiler fired and went uh, uh, back on. And then uh, you get there and ask the homeowner what the fault is, and they don't know. There is a way to get uh, an achieve uh, to see your last top 10 faults with this boiler here. And this is just a quick video to show you how to get to them and how to clear them before you leave. Uh, a lot of times, like uh, last week, we installed one of these here and uh, we got the OB because we didn't get all the air out uh, through the uh, purge mode, uh, which we didn't try. Uh, we wanted to see if it would work uh, without it. And uh, we got the OB fault. Uh, so that's a flow issue, meaning that we have either air in the boiler or the, uh, the pump's not working. So this is just a quick video. And then we're pretty much done. So I appreciate you hanging in there with me here. And uh, this is very quick. But it's a helpful little tool for you if you're doing these boilers and you want to see the fault codes or 
clear them before you leave so the next guy doesn't uh, see these faults. Hi, and welcome to Wiesman's Academy Training Lab. Today we're going to look how to retrieve the last top 10 faults or faults on your code history on the B1HA100 Vito Dens. It's a very simple, easy, quick thing. Sometimes the homeowner might press the reset button before you get there. and We might not know what the fault is when we get there. So there's a quick, easy way to check. So all we're going to do is uh, grab our stylus pen if you have one. I use a stylus because my fingers sometimes wander to the wrong buttons. So we're going to start by hitting the mode button until config or configuration is flashing down here on the bottom. So we're going to do that by hitting the arrows. And now you can see config is flashing. Once that's flashing there, we're going to hit OK. And now we're into uh, password mode or programming. So we're going to go up to uh, password for this one here is number 10. Once we get to 10, make sure you hit OK. And now we're at our fault history. And as you can see, our fault history, starting with the fault number one is the newest fault, is a 38. If we go up with our up arrow, we can now see that we've had an OB fault. And uh, a lot of these faults, we do have videos that you can go watch to see how to fix those type of faults. And these could have been prior faults that nobody cleared before they left. And our last one here, we have another one, uh, an F2 fault. And that seems to be all the faults we have on this boiler. So a lot of times when we're in training, I tell people, make sure before you leave, after you fix the problem, go in there and make sure that all your fault history has been cleared. That way for the next person that comes on the job, they don't see these faults because with this boiler here, you don't see uh, the time and date that it happened like you would on our 200. So all we're going to do on this boiler here is we're going to press and hold the R button. And you'll see all the faults uh, clear. We go to number one, as you can see here, we have zero, zero. So now we know all our faults have been cleared. So we fix the problem. We go in here, clear your faults, especially after your new installs, because sometimes we create a bunch of different faults. Like that OB is a flow issue, or it could be that they had error on a new installation, but they never went back and cleared the fault on the boiler. So make sure now that all the faults are cleared before you left, you fix the problem. We start with a uh, clean, fresh page. We just uh, back out of here and go to a main screen. So now we're back to the main screen. You can see that our boiler water temperature is about 122 here, and our outdoor temperature for today is 70 degrees. This concludes how to retrieve your last top 10 faults and how to clear. Sorry about that. So that uh, kind of brings us to the end. And I'm hoping that uh, you picked up a couple of little helpful hints uh, to help you with your uh, days out there. Uh, remember, we went over uh, your combustion triangle. So don't forget about the basics and don't uh, stress out going to that call. You know, we got uh, tech support as well. And if you didn't know, our tech support uh, during the winter time is, I believe, is open till uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, so you do have uh, all that tech support to help you out there as well. And a bunch of great guys that uh, will help you out. Uh, we did talk about the hard and soft lockouts a little bit, uh, the F4 fault and the different causes of uh, what could cause an F4 fault. And remember about that fault code history uh, to help you out as well. So I'm just hoping that you did get the information that you did come for. And remember, uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question. That's the way uh, you learn. And that's the way I learn anyway. So if it sounds dumb, I don't really care because that's the way I learn anyhow. So uh, th I want to thank everybody for joining us today and taking time out of your busy uh, days. As we know, they just get busier. And now if you do air conditioning, we're going to jump from heating right to air conditioning. So uh, and enjoy some of the slack time you're getting at this moment. We do look like we have one question so far. Um, have you experienced gas pressure loss in the winter? I had a job we did which had 7.5 inches and the boiler faulted in the middle of the winter. We rechecked and had 7.5 on static, but it dropped to 4.6 on high fire. 
it was about minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, was that for natural gas or propane? That's what you need to know. I have seen the wrong regulators get installed on propane or not enough, uh, not methanol, but the, the uh, ethanol that they put into the propane to keep it. Uh, and uh, sometimes even a full tank, if it's boiling too high, it's freezing. That stuff, uh, propane is freezing uh, while it's boiling uh, down to like minus uh, 300 degrees, something ridiculous like that. Um, but uh, I have seen issues with uh, regulators. Uh, uh, gas, even natural gas can uh, get heavy uh, in time as well. Uh, and their meters can uh, get uh, moisture in them as well. Uh, but besides that, uh, yeah, I'll be checking on your uh, regulators. Uh, make sure that they didn't put the wrong size regulator in there because uh, if it's the wrong size regulator, uh, you're going to get moisture buildup and your, your regulators are going to freeze up um, as well as the uh, octanol that they add into the uh, methanol that they add into the uh, propane as well to keep it from freezing. Uh, but yeah, it does happen. Um, I have seen it. Not so much on the natural gas side, but I have seen it happen on natural gas. We did have one uh, uh, incident here with the water department hooked up to the gas line and uh, started filling up the gas line. So uh, that was an interesting call from my friend uh, that they shut down a whole town uh, because they pumped water into the gas line and that was starting to freeze as well. So it was a nightmare out there. So it does happen, uh, not too often, thank goodness. Well, hopefully I answered your question. When used in test mode at high 100%, we need to open the DHW valve for keeping the temperature of the boiler in low temperature. Is that correct? No, you can uh, do a, a low fire test in that same spot and then you can do a high fire. All your pumps will come on uh, on the boiler uh, when it goes into test mode. So we're, you've got to circulate the water through the boiler. Remember, you've got to activate that flow sensor or flow switch to get the boiler to fire. So your pumps do come on. Uh, so it should uh, you should be able to test it in uh, low fire until it reaches limit and then it will drop. And then uh, you can modulate it because you can go from 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100%. We want you to start with uh, low fire or high fire and check them at both. Uh, if you're seeing it drop as it goes to high fire, uh, to me, that's a volume issue. Uh, so it's either you got some cloggage somewhere or the piping is not big enough uh, because we're starting to, we need more, more gas and it's not coming there. Um, so if that happens uh, in this boiler uh, encoding, uh, you can um, go in there and uh, modulate your heat down, uh, your output of the boiler uh, to at least get you uh, closer to high fire until you can figure out what's going on. Uh, so you can go into coding and just uh, kind of like down fire it a little bit and just watch it. And when it stays running, then you can leave it there until you can get out there. At least you can get them uh, more heat than just on high uh, low fire. Um, just a recommendation there. All right, looks like that is the last question for right now, Jay. All right, awesome. You guys have been great. Thanks for coming. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to see you uh, within the very near future. Uh, we're getting our shots and all this stuff going now. So hopefully uh, we can start moving into a live fire lab and start doing this all hands on. Again, thanks for coming and I appreciate it. And uh, thanks Miranda for your help today. Thank you, Jay. Just a few reminders before we close out today. Um, as I stated in the beginning, a recorded version will be on the video library and that YouTube channel. And also the individual videos that Jay showed you today will also be on this vid video library and the YouTube channel as individual videos. So you will be able to watch those um, instead of watching the entire seminar again. Um, a PDF of the presentation and the Q&A document will be sent out. Any email, any questions you have, you can email to the Academy US at Wiesman.com email and we will add them to that Q&A document. If you haven't already, keep an eye on our Academy website for other online seminars that we have coming up and a new announcement for April, May, and June. And with that being said, that does conclude today's seminar. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of your Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.